Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, if you haven't guessed, the uh, topic for today is love. It uh, was quite clear through uh, our Lord's Supper talk today and the songs we've been uh, singing. And this is the last of uh, in this series of understanding uh, the scriptures, or lessons from the scriptures. And so, you know, you, you might be thinking to yourself, this is going to be quite boring because it's, you know, it always is. It's when it's the last in the series. You know, uh, you know when they're thinking of ideas, they you know, list them on the board and we've got the great ideas up here and they come down, they come down. Well, when they get down to this one, you know, they're probably saying to themselves, uh, oh, man, I'm out, of all, I'm out of ideas. What are we going to do this talk on? And somebody said, I oh, just do it on love. You know, that covers everything. So back to the top of the list and uh, they're thinking, right, we'll put it. What's our good speakers? We'll put the uh, best speakers at the top. But by the time they get down to this one, somebody said, man, we're out of speakers. And someone said, uh, I'll just give it to Wayne, he'll do it. But no, that wouldn't be the case. If you're thinking that, that's not true, because what they've actually done is save the best or last. And no, I am not talking about the speaker, because clearly that is not the case. But as far as the subject goes, love, I would argue that this is the most important part of our series. This is such a good, strong, important subject. Uh, do you remember uh, the, our scripture reading this morning when that lawyer asked Jesus, you know, what is the greatest commandment? What was the answer? The answer was love, loving God. The second greatest commandment, you know, loving your neighbour as yourself. Just before that lawyer asked that question, the Sadducees, they had a go as well. Because these guys didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God. And they were trying to ask him trick questions into trying to make him look foolish in front of the crowd, ask him questions that nobody could answer. And so the question they asked Jesus was, you know, if, if there was a woman who was married to a bloke and he died, and so when he, unfortunately he died, and so she married one of his brothers, and unfortunately, that guy died, and so she married another one of the brothers, and he died, and so on and so on. And the question was, well, who's going to be the husband when they get to heaven? That's a kind of a trick question. Who would know the answer to that? But of course, Jesus was able to answer. They failed miserably in trying to trick him. His answer was, in heaven, there is no marrying or giving in marriage, that people will be like angels. And so the Pharisees were going to have a turn, try to trick Jesus. And they got together and there was a, a lawyer among them and he, wanted to, he was going to do the same thing. He was going to ask Jesus a question. Now, I'm not sure what his tactics were, but he thought, you know, if, probably he thought if Jesus answers these questions and gives him one example of the greatest commandment, he'd be able to argue, well, aren't all of God's commandments important, equally important? I mean, that's probably the most logical answer. You know, what would you say if you were asked that question? What is the greatest commandment? But again, Jesus had the answer to that question. Let's have a look at that reading again in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, starting at verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. So the interesting thing there is, you know, why didn't he choose one of the Ten Commandments or the whole of the Ten Commandments? Why did he choose those ones? The first one, loving God, is found in Deuteronomy. It's three times you can f you find that in Deuteronomy. In one of those, the first one, Deuteronomy 6, starting at verse 6, it says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. So that's where he, Jesus got that from. Jesus also labelled another command, a second one, even though the the lawyer didn't ask him that question. Jesus added to it and gave him the second most important command. 
about loving your neighbour. And that one is only found once in the book of Leviticus. And when you read that passage, the part about loving your neighbour seems to be, you know, like a, a sideline. It, it didn't seem, it's not the most important thing in there. There's so much going on. But Jesus chose that one. That one is found in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And it says, You shall not take vengeance nor hold any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. So Jesus selected those two commandments which covered most broadly the rest of the commandments. So he didn't belittle or do anything to those other commandments. He just chose those two commandments which summarised the entire law. And when you think about it, it's the perfect answer to that question. It's such profound insight into God's law could only come from the Lord himself. You know, I used to think that Jesus, as a kid, used to come home from a school, they went to school, and used to study the scriptures and he wrote, learn it and study it and study it and study it because how else did Jesus impress all those adults in the synagogues with his learning and his teaching? I, I think I misunderstood it because Jesus didn't have to learn anything. He already knew those scriptures. He knew all of those commands. He is the Lord. In essence, they were his commands. So what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? Because that theme about love carries on into the New Testament, into Jesus' teaching. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, it says, but now faith, hope and love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. When Jesus comes again, love still exists. How long will it exist? Forever, for as long as we are in heaven. But faith and hope, they won't be necessary anymore. You don't have to have faith in something you haven't seen when you have it. You don't have to hope for something if you've already got it. Love is the greatest. And so because of that, we need to keep ourselves in the love of God. We can't come in and out of love with God. In Jude uh, verse 21, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. We're going to keep ourselves in the love of God, which leads to the question, you know, why? Why should we love God? And the reason is because he first loved us. In 1 John 4 and verse 19, it says, we love, we love because he first loved us. And then he proved that to us by sending his son to us. In you know, John 3, 16, you'll know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. Why did he love us? Is it because we're so irresistible and perfect? Absolutely not. In Romans 5, verse 7 and 8, it says, For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, while we still hated him, while we still turned our back on him, while we lived for ourselves, while we did all the things that he hated, Christ died for us. And Jesus didn't grudgingly go to the cross. He didn't suffer and die because he was told to or he had to. He did it because he loved us. In Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 it says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So that leads to our next question, and that is, well, how do we love God? 
Is it good enough just to stand before God and say, I love you, but not do anything, not show it in our actions? Of course not. We wouldn't do that to someone we loved here on this earth. We don't say to someone, I love you, and then forget about them. Don't do anything to prove it. It's not good enough for someone here on this earth. It's not good enough for God. It has to be more than just saying, I love you. Matthew 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. The person who does the will of the Father will go to heaven. So our love, if we love God, it must be demonstrated by a willingness to follow him. In first, uh, sorry, John 14 and verse 23 it says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him and we will come and make our dwelling it with him. The one who does not love me does not follow my words. And the words which you hear, the things that Jesus is there saying there, is not mine but the father's who sent me. Love is keeping God's commandments. In 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and follow his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Loving God means keeping his commandments. You notice it says these commandments aren't burdensome. I remember thinking when I was younger that they were. There were things that I wanted to do that I couldn't, shouldn't or couldn't do. There were things I didn't want to do which I should have done. And they were burdensome. But that wasn't God's issue, that was mine. I didn't love God enough. If I love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength, I'm going to want to do everything for him. They won't be burdensome. So when Jesus says, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, I mean, what does that mean? It means loving God from the depth of your emotions, from deep within your heart. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23, it says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Loving God with all of our heart means Loving him from the depths of our heart, from the depths of our emotions, putting nothing before him, putting him first. Unlike the Pharisees, in, the, in Matthew 15 and starting at verse 7, it says, Jesus says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you by saying, This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me, and in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Why, what was their problem? What was the problem with the Pharisees? Why were they teaching, you know, doctrines of men as commandments of God? Because they didn't love him. They loved themselves. People who don't love God start preaching their own laws, their own doctrines as doctrines of God because they're doing, they want to please themselves. They want to please the people around them. People who love God follow his commandments. So when Jesus says, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, what could that mean, loving God with all of our soul? It means willing to give your life for him. as you would for a loved one here on this earth. You hear those stories all the time when somebody's drowning and someone jumps in the water to save them, not thinking about their own safety, and quite often they will perish because all they have on their mind is saving their loved one. And if we're willing to do that for someone we love here on this earth, how much more willing should we be able to, wanting to do it for God? In Revelation 12 and verse 11, and this is sort of prophesying about Christian martyrs here, Revelation 12 and verse 11 says, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, 
and they did not love their life, even when faced with death. I hope and pray that you know, we never have to put our life on the line. And, but it happens. It's been happening all through history. It happens now, elsewhere in the world. I hope we don't ever have to do that. But it, it's good to know that, you know that we think to ourselves, I would if I was put in that situation. Because I love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength, I am willing to give my life for him. Yes, hope it doesn't happen, but at the very least, at the very least, we should be willing to be a living sacrifice for God. In Romans 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So we, need, we should be living to serve God. That is loving God with all of our soul, living to serve him. What does it mean when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind? It means loving God with a sincerity of thought, having a deep desire to know God and to know what his will is so that we can obey him. You know, if uh, someone that you love here on this earth likes apricot chicken, it's not too much of a burden to go down the shop and buy the chicken pieces, the, uh, uh, what do they use, soup, chicken noodle soup, apricot nectar, whatever it is, and you'll make it for them. It's much easier to just, you know, drop in a KFC. But you'll do go that extra mile because you love them. You want to do what they want. And it's the same with God. We want, because of our love for him, we just want to do what he wants. Part of love of love. So we love God with all of our mind by not focusing on the things of this world, but focusing on the person that we love, which is God, and just doing uh, His will. What does it mean when uh, Jesus says, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your strength"? Loving Him with all of our strength. It means willing to place all of our efforts at his disposal, wanting to work for him, doing it with all of our might. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity, planning, knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. So while we're living on this earth, let's put in the effort, let's use all of our strength to work for God. I see examples of this working for God all the time here, and I'm sure you do too. I've noticed Damien, who has just been recently appointed as a deacon. I see him putting in this effort, extra effort. Is he doing it to please himself? No. He's doing it to please God. He's taking the position seriously. I see it with groups of people coming together to organise activities for the church to keep the faith going, to keep people connected. They're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it because they want to work for God, because they love him. You know, with our teachers teaching the children, which is such a hard thing to do, people who get lessons and other things ready uh, so that we can worship together. You know, people, there's not a lot of time in this world and people have, probably could be doing other things, but they just choose to work for God, to put the effort in. With our workers who go and visit people that need to Bible study and who have you know, issues that they have to resolve, there's so many things that are, that are going on that I don't even know about. Our elders, they come together to make sure the church is on track, that it teaches the truth, to resolve issues. It's a hard job, but they do it because they want to work for, the, for God, to put their best efforts in. When we come together to worship, you know, the building's been cleaned. It's a large building to clean. Everything's ready for us to worship. People are doing that work behind the scenes, all the work that's done in the kitchen. I see people coming here week after week after week to worship God and to encourage each other in the faith, making sure people are okay, making sure they're encouraged. 
working for God, putting in their best efforts. And when we all work together, it starts to flow on to each other. In 1 John 4, starting at verse 7, it says, Beloved, let's love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. That, just, that summarises everything that we're talking about. God is love. By this, the love of God was revealed in us, that God has sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we remain in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. God so loved us, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God remains in us. So what's the evidence? What's the proof that we love God? The proof is if we love our brethren. We love God if we love our neighbour. We love God if we love that the grouchy old guy that lives down the street. It's how we know that we love God. And there are many benefits from loving God, and we can't talk about them all because we'd be here all day. But if we all love God together, we are strengthened. You know, when you go to work, and you work hard all day, and you get home, you're tired and worn out. You have to go out in the yard and dig some holes and trenches or whatever. The harder you work, the more tired you get. But not when we work for God. Amazingly, it's the exact opposite. You may have noticed, the harder you work for God, the stronger you become. It increases your faith. It increases your love. The harder we work, the better it is for us. Together, when we all love God, we are bonded together in unity. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 14 says, In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The perfect bond of unity. When we love God, we become more united. Uh, so I suppose the question is, uh, do you love God? with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength? That's the question. I try to, and I think what the answer for me would be probably the same as you. I try to, but I have room for improvement. In fact, it's something we should never be satisfied with. We should always be trying to love God even more. At the end of uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 24, he says, grace be with the, all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. What type of love do we have for God? You know, when uh, Jesus comes again, we're going to experience the perfect love. It won't get any better. Because let's face it, sin has kind of ruined this world. It is full of pain and sorrow and grief and anxiety and depression. All these negative things. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but you know sometimes when something really good happens, something fantastic, this fleeting moment of immense joy and you just feel like bouncing up and down, it doesn't last very long. But in heaven, that's what it's going to be like all the time. Because there's no, none of those negative things exist in heaven. It is this pure love and ultimate joy and happiness and confidence. And you'll be thinking to yourself, this is exactly what it's supposed to be like. That perfect love which will last forever. When Jesus comes again, you're going to instantly know that is what you want. Man, that is the most... Thing you're going to most desire most of all in the world. But if you don't do something about it right now, it's going to be too late then. So we would urge you that if you 
love God and you want to experience that perfect love in heaven with the Lord, then you need to be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins. To have your sins washed away, to be buried through baptism into Jesus' death, to be raised up again, to walk in newness of life, to be added to the church, people that are saved, the church that belongs to Christ. If you'd like to do that, then we would urge you to do that today. Just talk to anyone after the service. They'll put you in contact with one of the elders and they'll organise to have you baptised. Very easy to do. And it may be very easy to do, but it will be the most important decision uh, you have ever made. We'd encourage you to do that today. During the study today, we're going to be looking at the second command, uh, which is loving your neighbour as yourself. Thank you very much.